There's some dangerous large uh, carnivore out there. And I saw that bird pick a young deer off the ground and fly away. And uh, it was just about getting dark, and we started panicking, running down this ridge, not really having any clue what was throwing rocks in our vicinity, good-sized rocks. And uh, I stopped long enough to get a 357 out of my backpack and looked back, and that's when I saw it. I saw one. Uh, for a week, the, the town's defiance was being harassed by a werewolf. And it's actually attacked two railroad workers, uh, killed livestock. You know, just a lot of weird stuff that was going on. Good evening, Monster Xers. This is Gunnar Monson, along with my good friend and re consummate researcher, Shane Hardcore Corson. <laughs> Shane is on the road this week uh, on his way. Actually, I think he's taking a little vacation. Shane, are you there? I am, and uh, yeah, indeed, taking a, a little vacation down to uh, San Diego to see my folks, yeah. Awesome, and you ran into some a uh, little bit of crazy weather yesterday on the way. It sounded like I was I saw you posted on Facebook that that uh, they actually had a tornado warning out. That's which is kind of crazy for California. Yeah, we were uh, up by Corning, uh, California, Northern California, and got uh, you know listen to the radio and had one of those weather um, warning uh, things come on over the airway, and we were listening, thinking, man, we're we're heading right into that. Sure enough, we got, you know, close enough where, you know, we got the hail, I mean, extreme hail. There was, you know, carts spun out everywhere. People were, um, had their carts parked on their overpasses, uh, because the, the uh, lightning got pretty crazy. And, uh, the hail and the rain and wind and, uh, so we, uh, I had enough and we turned around and went back to Red Bluff, which is, uh, was about 50 miles from there and just spent the night there. Otherwise, I'd, I'd be in San Diego at the moment. <laughs> well, I uh, appreciate you uh, taking time out of your vacation to uh, be with us today. So <laughs> I know, I mean, uh, I just saw you Friday. We had, It was cool. Uh, I know Shane and I both uh, got to go to uh, the first Hopsquatch of 2016. It, uh, the guy Edward puts on up in Portland, and uh guy uh, kicked it off right with uh, Bob Gimlin was the guest. And... Uh, I always, you know, I I love people's stories. Of course, uh, the story of uh, the filming of of Patty, you know, and and Bob Bob being there. I love the stories, but I love better to hear them live from somebody. Um, every time, you know, you always get a lot of detail, and I and I love the context of of things like like the story around the filming. You know, that the filming was yeah. such a short period of time, um, just like our guest today, you know, Todd's sighting was like less than 30 seconds, and, and the whole story and the context around uh, his sighting, and, and it's just fascinating to listen to Bob. He's a great storyteller anyway, but yeah, to hear all the details of what happened before and after, and, and uh, yeah, it just... It was awesome. It was a uh, a great event, um, yeah. and Bob is such a such a gentleman. You know, he is uh, uh, salt of the earth, and and I 
I know anybody who's in our Facebook group, uh, Shane posted a picture that Bob uh, took graciously took with Shane and I, and and I did bid on a a large uh, mm-hmm. uh, glass foot that Bob's uh, signed for me, and uh, so that'll be a treasure for a long time. And we might use that at our next year's uh, Tillamook Forest Research Group uh, party for Dick. <laughs> ah, yeah. <laughs> so we've got with us today is Mr. Todd Neese. Uh Todd lives here in Oregon. Um, I don't know. Most people, you know, Todd has been around for a, a good long time. I was looking at eight, and uh, his, his sighting was in the Oregon Coast Range uh, near Saddle Mountain, and it was in 1993, so that this year it will be 23 years ago. One of the things is uh, that is fascinating fascinates me about people that have Bigfoot encounters, and uh, some people how it just changes their lives. I mean, they become fixated on finding an answer, and you know, walking through that doorway from are they to what are they, and uh, it's just just uh, too cool and. And uh, I know Todd has uh, been working um, to uh, bring some groups together to, uh, you know, work together and share information and uh, with his uh, American Primate Conservancy. And uh, I'm ready to uh, get to it and bring Todd on. Mm -hmm. So without further ado, Mr. Todd Neese. Todd, how are you, buddy? Hey, I'm great. And yourself? <laughs> I'm doing good. How's the movie great. going? <laughs> oh, my gosh. My back is killing me, but uh, it's coming along great. Thanks for asking. Yeah, well, you are getting up there in years, so uh, <laughs> I can imagine. I <laughs> so, but Todd and his, his lovely bride, Diane, who were married uh, not this year at Beachfoot, but... Uh, in nineteen and two thousand nineteen and two thousand and fourteen, uh one of the surprise events uh, uh at Peachfoot was uh Todd and Diane got married, so um and I was fortunate enough to be there and, and I know Shane was so No, I was surprised. Uh, and, <laughs> but it was it was uh, it was awesome. Uh how's the so you found a new big big foot research center, uh in close to the to Mount Hood. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, well, um, Diane and I have been looking uh, really since early last summer for a um, uh, some place a little closer to our research area, wilderness uh, uh, area, not uh, too far from here. And uh, it's a bit long, uh, as you know, a long search, and we finally found. Uh, uh, a terrific buy um, near Welch's uh, on this kind of the southwest flank of Mount Hood, uh, a little over an acre and a half. Uh, very private and very uh, uh, you know natural uh, setting, and we, we just love it. But uh, yeah, yeah, as you mentioned, this is going to serve as the, at least the temporary headquarters for the American Primate Conservancy uh, as we. Get things unpacked and get things organized. We'll, we'll really get things kicked off a little bit, uh, a little bit better. So, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a labor of love. But Todd, for those, I mean, you've been in big footing for a long time now. I mean, you're you had your sighting in in uh, 1993. So we're coming up here uh, on 23 years. Can you believe it's been that long since? Since uh, you had that, because they're kind of it, it's it's always a fascinating story to me when folks have have an encounter and and people that become researchers and you are a hardcore Bigfoot researcher. Yeah, it does seem like it's it's a uh, uh, time flies. I mean, for me, that sighting and and the the entire experience that's come along with it. Uh, is just as fresh in my mind today as it was the day it happened. Uh, and all that's taken place in the last, uh, you know, like you say, nearly 23 years, uh, it, it just seems like it's flown by. 
but uh you know during that time we've we've uh, had an opportunity to meet uh, many many great researchers such as uh, you and uh, Shane and um and the good folks at the Olympic project and and Bob Gimlin and so many others uh, over the course of time and it's just amazing. I mean, and so many of them have have, uh, have passed on now too. That uh, that I had a, a great opportunity to meet people like Renata Hinman and Professor Grover Krantz and, and most recently Ray Crow. And yeah, yeah, time is flying. That's for sure. But uh, but we're gonna stay in the chase. Well, just in case for for the Monster X listeners that aren't familiar with you, can you give tell, give us a uh, Go ahead and tell us your story about the sighting that you had there in 90, April of '93. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, like you, like you stated, uh, this was uh, very close to Saddle Mountain, um, which is just east of the coast by about 10 miles. It's in the heart of the Oregon Coast Range, which is a, a temperate rainforest and and, the, and uh, very very dense uh, forest, and the, what we were doing, uh, Gunner, was that we were. Um, I was with the 1249th Combat Engineers, and what we did uh, as combat engineers involved uh, the use of explosives in our training, and so that's what we were doing that day. We we had gone had gotten permission to go up on some uh, heavily secured private timberland uh, on this particular day where they there were three scenarios that we faced uh and uh we throughout the day we we hit these different sites these were rock quarries by the way the the forest uh company that owned it at the time they used these quarries to quarry their own gravel for when they punch roads in and, and to make perfect places to do our our demolition exercises and so uh so it was that morning we had done cutting charges at the first site. The second site we did uh, a breach of a of a, a mock minefield, you know, simulating blowing a, a passable lane through a uh, a minefield. And uh, the last exercise was a cratering charge. And this is where you just, for instance, blow a road in half uh, in order to not deny the enemy the use of that road. And... Uh, I would say this was around like three in the afternoon by the time we got this this last uh, um, uh, explosives prepped and ready to go. We we pulled the fuses on about 250 pounds of ammonium nitrate that we'd been soaking in diesel fuel for a few hours and and uh, and got the heck out of there. Our SOP was just get in the rigs, convoy down to a staging area, and wait for the explosion. Go back and check the work, see if you did it right. And uh, so it was, we were convoying down the hill, uh, uh, this windy, narrow logging road uh, to get away from this this uh, bomb, which was set to go off in about 11 minutes. And uh, it was a really a nice day in April in the coast range. I mean, the, the sun was out, and uh, it, it was uh, pleasantly uh, pretty clear that day. And so as I sat behind the dr- driver in the, uh, the Humvee uh, vehicle that I was in, uh, I just went ahead and unzipped the window, and I had my elbow hanging out, and I'm glancing about the country because I had hunted in, in uh, this area pretty extensively for both deer and elk. And so it was I'm just doing what I would normally do, and I'm looking around the countryside seeing if I can spot any wildlife. So we rounded this corner, a uh, slow sweeping turn to the right, and as we came out from behind some brush, I had a clear view over to across this ravine to the to the second site, the one that we had detonated oh, an hour or so before this. And what I see are these three very distinct jet black figures standing Right in the in the middle of of the gravel pit, they were standing shoulder to shoulder, three across, on two legs, huge, um, and uh, and they were obviously watching us. And uh, you know, I'm 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 looking at this going, that can't be what I'm. I, it, it appears to be, you know, it's just this whole 
process of denial, I guess. And and uh, had this been a five, ten second viewing, I you know I might have had to second guess myself. But I looked at them for a full, I'd say twenty five seconds or so before we did lose sight uh, of them eventually. And I'm watching these things. Um, picture, if you will, they're, they're, again facing us. One in the middle, standing a full head taller than the other two, and this th this thing could have been easily eight to nine feet in height. On either side, left and right of this larger uh, creature, were two others, and again looking in our direction. And what struck me about them was their their silhouette. For one, is the arms uh, stretch well below their knees. Um, I don't know whether they were stooped over or not, to be honest with you, but those arms, I'll never forget those arms, and, and their huge barrel chest, um, broad shoulders, um, and again, not a stitch of clothing. I don't know, it was just black hair covered, whatever. They look like bodybuilders, but with, <laughs> covered in black hair, I guess. Um, but the other thing that struck me were the two that flanked the larger creature, which stood like a statue, did not move at all. The two on either side of it did move. They, in fact, were shifting weight from, from one foot to the other and kind of rocking side to side. And in the process, you could see their extremely long arms uh, crossing back and forth in front of their knees. And uh, um, I would come to learn much later talking to biologists and primatologists. This is a very common um, activity with primates if they feel anxious or excited, and uh, and I have kept my ears open for other uh, such sightings, and there and there's actually quite a few of them that display this back and forth swaying, if you will. But anyway, just to to wrap it up, we we turned a corner, we got down to the staging area, and uh, uh, as there were still a few trucks coming in behind me, I took an opportunity to try to run back up the road a little bit, hoping to get another view of these things. And uh, unfortunately, I could not. There was there was a kind of a knoll that blocked my view. And I and I and, and I just I realized that it was I would have to go several hundred yards further up the road, which which in this kind of a activity, this kind of exercise would be huge taboo. So so while I'm standing there with my my hand and my forehead on my tiptoes, really hoping to catch a glimpse of something. I was approached by another uh, a soldier, um, uh, Sergeant Jeff Martin, and I heard him yell out my name, and I got my arm to my side, and I looked over, and I, I, he goes, what are you, he goes, what you looking at? And I said, nothing, and he just kind of kept coming toward me. And when we got, you know, toe-to-toe, -to -toe, he gave me this look, and he goes, I don't suppose you saw what I saw down at that second blast site. And I'm like, no way. Because, uh, you know, I had assumed I was the only one that had seen him. And I wasn't about to say it, really, so I just, I don't know, Jeff, what did you see? You know, you go first. And uh, he he proceeded to describe the same animals, the same number, the same color. They said, I saw three huge black, and then, then he just kind of has it for a second, and he said, Bigfoot. And I went, yep, that's what I saw. And, uh, you know, it was nice to have that kind of corroboration. Um, not that I needed it, because I I, I, I have uh, no doubt what I saw, but it was nice to know that somebody else had seen them as well. And being a traditional guardsman, uh, this is makes another interesting twist, uh, we would uh, drill or train one weekend per month, which is pretty standard. And it was the next drill in May of 93 that two more soldiers actually came forward and also admitted to us having seen these same creatures. So, so in that sense, it's kind of a it's a it's a pretty unusual sighting in that you know obviously the activity that we were doing. Uh, the multiple animals, which are, are fairly rare uh, sightings, and, and, uh, and of course, four uh, independent eyewitnesses. So, uh, 
Anyway, that's, uh, you know, I went from skeptic to believer pretty quickly, and uh, and it's uh, it was really an epiphany for me. And research for me, and I've been doing it ever since. I don't know, it's just kind of cathartic for me to, to feel like there was a purpose behind it, and i got to do something about it. And so that's that's what got me started. So uh, now wasn't there, was there any other uh, indication that there was something weird going on before you are driving away and, and see these three mm. bipedal creatures? I mean, where you were well, blasting glad, away. Yeah. yeah, I'm glad you asked that. There, In hindsight, there was an incident that took place, and it was when we were down at that quarry where these creatures were seen at uh, a little bit later. Um we, I told you we were doing this this minefield breach, and and what they basically do is a uh, there are a number of anti tank mines just laid on top of the ground, not actually buried. And our job was to take a couple of squads and go in there, run a what they call a ring main, a debt cord uh, through that area, and then branch off of that with blocks of C4 plastic explosives. And you only need to set them about six inches from the mine in order to destroy it. But when we do this stuff, when we're doing this training, we, we really practice as if we were, you know, in combat. And part of that is noise discipline. Obviously, you're not going to be running around knowing the enemies out there and, and making noise. And, and uh, it was during this, I was a squad leader at the time, and during this exercise where we're in placing, everybody's busy going about, most of them down on their hands and knees, placing these uh, blocks of C4, I distinctly recall hearing this really kind of a piercing whoop sound. It just like, like whoop, but really loud, super loud. And it and I, the first thing I thought of is okay, who's who's cutting up? Who's who's fooling around here? And I was going to jump down somebody's throat, and I looked up, and everybody's just going about their business, and I and I. You know, I I put it out of my mind at that time. I was just like, okay, whatever, and and went about my business. But you know, like I say, in hindsight, I you know that whoop was really loud, and it was it almost seemed like it came from a little further back in the tree line from where we were. Again, we were out in this in the scrabble pit, but we're completely surrounded by forest. But you know, I, I've always I've always wondered whether or not we were being observed at that time. Um, but to answer your question, that that's the only other thing I can think of that uh, preceded uh, my actual sighting that kind of made me think maybe we weren't alone. Well, what uh, I mean, a lot of people. There are a lot of people that have Bigfoot sightings, and and most of them don't, you know, become, uh, for lack of a better word, obsessed <laughs> with with. Uh, <laughs> With Bigfoot research after they have their sighting, what what was it for you that made you, you know, dive into into the field? I mean, you you've been doing this pretty hardcore for going on, you know, twenty three years. So, I mean, why, well, why did you have uh, a sighting? And go ahead. I was going to say, uh, you know, initially, I, I that wasn't my goal, as at least to do public research. Um, I will tell you this, when I got back uh, from that weekend of training and got back to my civilian job, uh, I took the first opportunity I could to, to make a beeline for the library. And uh, God knows I hadn't stepped in one of those for quite a while, but I had to find out more. I had to find out. I mean, your mind is just swirling with all these questions. It's like, how can they be out there and we don't see them or, or they're not seen very often? And how come nobody's ever caught one uh, or found a body? And all the same questions that, you know, we all hear time and time again. And, and so I, it was a personal quest for me initially to go out and, and, and try to find those answers. I walked out of that library with a stack of books over a foot tall. Uh, uh, pretty much everything I could find at that time, uh, not knowing uh, over time I'd, I'd end up meeting most of those authors. It, it was just a matter of things that, that kind of cascaded after that. And I was, I'll be honest with you, you know, 
Shane and Gutter, I, I, I was I was kind of satisfied with doing that to a degree, but there's something about having a personal knowledge of something that is both scientifically and historically important that kind of eats at you, you know. It, 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 it bothers you that, you know, you want somebody and at least get it off your chest. Tell somebody who's, A, going to believe you, and B, maybe do something about it. And I didn't know those kind of people were out there. And uh, ironically, you know, I back when there were newspapers, uh, I, I, I happened to be browsing through the uh, through the want ads and uh, and the classifieds, and and I'm just kind of going down the columns, killing time, drinking coffee one morning, and all of a sudden I see the word Bigfoot in bold print, and I'm like, no. So I, I look a little closer because it was in the it was in the help wanted section, and 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 it said. Uh, uh, looking for field researcher, serious inquiries on way, blah, blah, blah. And it had a number, 1-800-BIGFOOT. I can't make that up. So <laughs> I, I I, finally said, well, here it is. It, it, at least here's somebody I can unload this on and, and maybe go on with my life. And and, and uh, so I called, and I Initially got a, a answering machine, and finally I got called back, and it happened to be uh, the folks that were running the Bigfoot Research Project, which I believe ran from about '92 to '95. It was a uh, it was uh, spearheaded by none other than Peter Byrne, uh, mm-hmm. as you know, just a pioneer, uh, one of the pioneers in Bigfoot research, and a pretty good uh, uh, cast of uh, field researchers and, and uh, technical experts. Um, I just, I told them, here's, they sent me a report, and I filled it out and got it back to them, and lo and behold, they said, we want to be you. And they wanted me to take them to the site. And I said, well, you're not going to be able to get in there. You see, it's highly secured private timberland, and the only reason we got in there was because we were doing, you know, the government had made some sort of a contractual deal to have access for that couple of days. And he said, well, just, we'll meet you there. And so I met them at the gate, and they proceeded to pull a master key out of their pocket and unlock the gate and said, let's go. To this day, I don't know how Peter Byrne persuaded the the timber company to give him a master key, but uh, I was glad they did, uh, and I actually ended up with it for several years after uh, after that, which was very helpful in my research. But anyway, that, the whole concept is that I got to finally meet people that that were researching and were very uh, credible and, and serious about what they were doing. So, you know, over time, I, I kind of got to become friends with them. Um, they were doing a, uh, a program for the uh, uh, Unsolved Mysteries and asked me if I would be willing to come on camera and actually, you know, tell my story. And reluctantly, and I do mean that, I, I'm in fact, I almost changed my mind that morning, but I thought, no, I said I'd do it. So I went out. And that was the first television program that I ever did, and that was uh, uh, interesting. But uh, just over the course of time, going to different conferences, being asked to speak at conferences uh, eventually, uh, it's just kind of snowballed, and uh, it, quite frankly, I find it uh, fascinating, and it's kind of fun, too. I mean, uh, I got to meet you and Shane and and uh, a lot of a lot of other folks uh, in the field, and uh, um, it's uh, it's an interesting pursuit, and it's it's a mystery that that I hope to solve someday. Yeah, I mean it's um, it's fascinating. I remember when we first met. Um, I think I, I I contacted you through uh, the BFRO at the time, and uh, oh yeah, we met. We met up in uh, on Saddle Mountain, and I believe mm-hmm. the gentleman's name that we met was Jim, and uh, you took us to where you had had um, 
you had had a uh, subsequent ep- expedition up there, which with I believe Peter was there and Ron Moorhead. Is that right? Correct. That is correct. Yeah. We did. And a, you, uh, we had an, This was 1998 um, on the south flank of Saddle Mountain, and Ron and Peter and I were up there for about eight days duration. And uh, you took us to where you had, had done the expedition and, and uh, showed us uh, the tree that you were standing at <laughs> when uh, you were were greeted from, the, I say greeted from behind, that sounds a little, you you might want to explain that a little <laughs> bit. Actually, it was in But uh, uh, you, yeah. I mean, <laughs> that, that was a, uh, that uh, was not your only experience with what you think was a, a Bigfoot. You had a, uh, an experience when you were out doing that expedition. I've, I've actually had uh, three. Now, keep in mind when I say encounters, encounters come in lots of different flavors and, and different conditions. And uh, just to be clear, I've only had one visual encounter. Um, the, 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 the one you're talking about, which took place um, five years later during this expedition, uh was a, by far the closest I've ever gotten to these things, uh, and perhaps a little too close. Um, I had uh, secured some seismic ground sensors from the North American Science Institute, and I'd gone up above the base camp up into uh, up on the slopes of the mountain uh and i what I decided to do with these, there were a set of eight of them, was I was going to kind of make this picket line uh, invisible fence, if you will. Seismic ground sensors will actually measure, they'll sense the vibration in the ground from people walking. They're used for all kinds of different security purposes as well as uh, as uh, military. And they're incredibly sensitive. Um, I, ha- I happen to own a set of four of them, and I can tell you they, under the right conditions, a one of these sensors can pick up footfalls up to a hundred yards away. Uh, you know, and I've tested that out, and it really just depends on the on the ground. But anyway, I was up there, and I was putting these in. A hailstorm came. Uh, came in, and I, I opted to go up into some old-growth forest, which was a lot closer than trying to get back down to the base camp. And so I went up there to just basically stand under some old-growth furs and let them be my umbrella until this this uh, cell of the hail passed by. And and while I was there, I had the urge to answer the call of the major, and so I did. And um, it was as I was just buckling my belt on my pants that I was met with uh, a very sudden, extremely loud, uh, incredible roar from close range. Uh, I would estimate less than 100 feet away, probably as close as 75 feet away, that just literally paralyzed me with fear. And I always thought that term was just some sort of a euphemism, but I'm here to tell you, it's it's real. I this this what I call a roaring bark uh, because it lasted perhaps as long as three seconds. Again, ear splitting loud roar that ended in this kind of a guttural bark at the very end. You know, it's like, yeah, you know, I can't even, I don't even demonstrate it. it. It's, it's amazing. It's nothing that a bear or a cooter or an elk or anything out there could do. Uh, and again, the volume was, it was just unbelievable. Um, and I froze. And I, I just, pretty much waited for death to come. I, I've never been so scared in my life. I mean... And I've that's somebody who's been in, in combat. I mean, you've been to... Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. Seriously. I mean, that's, I mean that's, I've... To, to put it in context, I mean, that's... I have swam you know, with sharks. I have jumped out of perfectly good working airplanes. I have had rockets and mortars fired at me continuously. I'm telling you right now, I have never 
been that scared. So scared that I could not move, even though every ounce of me said run, there was something much more powerful, almost primal, that said, if you want to survive, if you if there's any chance you're going to live through this, just don't move. And I didn't, and I couldn't. And I this went on for at least two minutes. I don't think I blinked. And finally, I just, whatever made this this roar was hiding behind this, this rather large hedge of scotch broom and, and salad. Uh, it never did step out. I'm almost glad it didn't. Um, but I just, I, I, it took me two minutes to gather myself and, and finally slowly retreat back down that mountain. And when I say back down, I mean I'm backed down that mountain uh staring behind me the whole time it was uh that was the second um encounter i had the third one that I really had, that time? no you know and that's what kills me i i i had brought along a 12 gauge shotgun a nine millimeter handgun and a 300 weatherby magnum rifle very high powered rifle and i had i'm thinking i'm just going to be within eyesight of the you know of the base camp. I'll just leave them here. I'll be fine. Uh, yeah. At the time, no, <laughs> I, I was not armed. And frankly, do you think that would have mattered? I don't. That's where I was going. Yeah. I I don't okay. know that uh, the 300 magnum might have uh, uh, at least slowed something down. Or it, uh, it's a very powerful gun, but uh, would I have been able to get it up in, on target in time? I don't. No, I kind of doubt it, especially at that range. But uh, it was what it was. And uh, anyway, the third encounter that I strongly believe I had was in the course of an investigation up the Roaring River. Um, they, this was uh, a rock hound that had gone up there and had taken his dog with him, hiked up some ex- incredibly uh, rugged uh terrain to get to an area that he was familiar with where at certain times of the year when the water level drops in Roaring River it exposes this this uh this lava bed and embedded in that lava bed is what he called common opal. And so he had gone up there uh with the idea of uh taking his rock hammer and chisel and and walking out of there with a bag full of this uh, common opal. And uh, it was while he was down on that bank chipping away with his hammer and his and his chisel at this opal that his dog, which was an a Australian shepherd, not a small dog, uh, began to act up. It was barking and growling and staring into the woods. Well, he's down right at the water level, and so the dog's up a little higher than he was, and, and the dog just wouldn't stop. He's thinking, okay, he's got a squirrel, a raccoon, but it was just something about the dog's demeanor that he he said, i got to check this out. So he put his rock hammer down in his bag, and he walked up to where the dog was, and he looked in the direction the dog was looking, and he was literally 50 feet less than, in fact, I, I can tell you exactly, he was 47 feet from what he called, not a Bigfoot, but a gorilla. That's what he said. I saw a gorilla standing upright, having a staring match with my dog, and with every exhaled breath, it would grunt. And it did not look happy. And at that, this gentleman had shoved the dog off the log, and they both ran out, and very uncharacteristic of most Bigfoot. This one actually took chase. And it ran now. It Well, I... I would say it escorted them out of that area, but it it was not happy they were in there. Uh, It charged them twice before they were able to get away. And as it was a couple weeks later, he was put in touch with me and we, myself and another um, research partner of mine, went in with him to investigate this. We got to the site finally um, over, again, some pretty rough territory. It takes about 40 minutes to get in a mile. 
Um, and in order, sure enough, there's his hammer and chisel and, and collection bag laying there, right there by the river where he had left it. And so we, you know, that's when we measured where were you standing, where was this animal. We looked for tracks. It wasn't very good terrain to get tracks, a lot of rocks and debris. Um, but this is where it got really interesting. On our way back out, and we we probably only spent about 30 minutes in that area. On the way back out, we took the very same route, and we got to this one point along this this cliff. They got a cliff to your left and just kind of an open area with ferns and, and cedars to your right, and we're walking along this cliff. We walked into a wall of the most horrendous smell, and not skunk-like at all. In fact, it was... Uh, uh, it was it was just so pungent and so strong. Uh, I, I equate it with almost like if you if you had chicken that went bad and you threw it in your garbage can in, in a week of summer that was ninety degrees and and a week later pulled that lid off and you get hit in the face with that. Oh yikes! You know that, that just not a pleasant smell. That it smelled like. Death almost. I mean, like like a, a carcass is what it smelled like. But the odd thing is, we were just there maybe 45 minutes earlier, and that smell wasn't there. But more interestingly, it was the the concentration of it was something I've never experienced before. You could literally be standing 10 feet away from where the smell was and not smell anything. You would expect that something that strong of a smell would get, you know, stronger and stronger and stronger as you get to the source. It was like 10 feet away. You couldn't smell anything. You walked 10 feet, and it was on. And, I mean, it almost knocked you over. And you could walk out the other side of it if you kept going, and it would stop pretty instantly as well. It was just focused in this one area. And, again, it wasn't there 45 minutes earlier. And we did a just a peripheral search just to say, okay, we're, there's got to be a source for this. And never found it, but I'll tell you what it really it really seems to uh to match what so many witnesses have told me that these things smell like and and all these things put together just that I really believe that i I finally got my opportunity to smell these things and and uh, whatever it was had left that area just before we got there but it 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 left something behind. Well, and that encounter, isn't that in Joe Bielart's book? I believe it is. I, I, yeah, I think I Joe talks good. about that. I, yeah. I know you had shared it with me before, but that um, I think uh, if Joe had it in his, his book, The the Bigfoot Highway. So, yeah, right. that's pretty trippy. So, um, question in the chat room, Todd, is uh, when's the last time that you've been back to – the site of your original sighting. So that that uh, that uh, piece of property, which is huge, it's one of the largest private tracts of of uh, timberland out there. At the time, was owned and operated by Cavanhand Forest Products. Since then, it was bought out. I want to say around the mid '90s, it was bought up by uh, Willamette Industries. They changed all the gates, they changed all the locks, and they heavily patrol it. And I have not been able to get access since. So to answer your question, it's been a while since I've been to back to that exact area. Now that being what, said, what, during during hunting season, they do open up a few of the of the main roads that go in there, but nothing that would get me, you know, to that exact location. So, you frankly, are there's, still there's so many active. other places. Go ahead. How, so, go ahead. You're you're still very active in field research. I mean, that's there's you know there's people oh, yeah. that are armchair researchers, and you're definitely not. Uh, an armchair researcher, you're somebody who actually goes out into the forest and, and actively research. Uh, where are where are you currently actively researching and, and 
what what kind of results are you getting, if anything? Um, well, I our our current research area um, is um, south of Mount Hood in a wilderness area that I'd rather not disclose at this time. Um, well, uh, if you would just in time, GPS location. I would appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. I'll. Yeah, I'll, uh, <laughs> but, yeah that's. No, uh, it's just uh, we've we've actually got uh, we have nine uh, currently have nine cameras active out in in this area spread throughout this area. It's around the forty five hundred foot level, and right now pretty well uh, inundated with snow. Um, we we got the last three cameras up just before the last snowfall, and we've been doing this for well a couple of years now and and with some varying degrees of uh, success at least as far as capturing wildlife but we've got some really you know we set all of our cameras on video and this is after playing around with both still shots and video Um, I just think there's the the video gives you a lot more detail that, that sometimes still shots won't give you so all of ours are set on video. We've gotten some amazing pictures of bear and uh, elk and deer and uh, a couple of pesky squirrels. One of, one of the things we're kind of proud of is we, we did get a uh, an amazing shot of a very rare Canadian lynx. Uh, they've, they've been thought to have uh, been uh, gone in that particular area for some time, and uh, so so we you know. Bottom line is we are getting that uh, uh, some rare animals. Um, it's it's really kind of a uh, it comes down to odds and and really trying to position yourself in an area that you believe that your odds are going to be the highest. And uh, I have been after studying a lot of different terrain, a lot of different uh, uh, sightings, and, and and some commonalities between. Uh, those areas uh, we have come up with this one particular area that we think has all of the the attributes the the uh, the resources uh, the food resources and the habitat and and and, and being a wilderness area it's really pristine I mean it's this area has never been logged there's no roads going into it it's really it's the way it was you know ten thousand years ago uh, and uh, so it, and it it obviously just from what we have captured on film does support abundant wildlife. Um, and as you know, we also, uh, have been, uh, incorporating drone technology with, uh, our right. research, uh, having purchased the, uh, Phantom three, uh, uh, professional camera system that, uh, we're pretty excited about. Um, um, we plan to, Get that airborne as often as we can over our research area, and and, and utilize that. We we have the seismic ground sensors, um, and uh, you know there's other emerging technologies that through the conservancy we're hoping to be able to acquire as well. Things like solid phase micro extraction equipment, which a lot of people are not familiar with. Uh, it's it's a uh, Fairly inexpensive, very um, uh, accurate way of, of measuring. Um, for instance, uh, scat is one of the things that uh, Fish and Wildlife have been using on identifying different uh, sources of, of scat by using solid phase micro extraction. You can you can actually uh, collect. Uh, molecular data that that's uh, that's uh, in essence uh, decomposing on on the uh, on the specimen and, and they've done so with, with great accuracy so that's something that we're looking into. Um, but uh, is that kind of the, is that the thing where they it's actually pulls off odor or I mean pull off yeah a, it was it was yeah. Well, you might be uh, you might be interested to to know that in, in this technology arose in part from people in the coffee industry. Um, they they were able to, but people in coffee in 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 the uh, the wine industry, uh, the perfume industry, they found that, that this technology literally everything decays 
uh, you know, at a, at a at all times. And if if you're a viable creature, you know, like we slough off millions of cells a day, but we regenerate them. Um, uh, but certain objects will just simply decay, and in, in the process of doing so, they release gases, and within those gases uh, are millions, trillions of molecules that are that are being released. SPME uses a specialized uh, instrument that that exposes a special sorbent wick, and you don't even have to touch the actual sample. You just have to get over it, and, and really only for a few seconds. And, and it, then you seal it up. You get it back to a laboratory, or in some cases, some universities have this equipment now, and you get it analyzed, and it will break down up to, uh, I, I want to say, close to 100 different chemical compounds in some cases, not parts per million, but parts per trillion. So you can imagine the, the, how specific of a fingerprint you can get from 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 a sample. So much so as they they, they believe, at least the uh, uh, biologists that I've been uh, talking to um, believe that they can identify not only the species but the specific uh, animal itself because of the of the so detailed. Uh, uh, results that they're getting, but that's just that's just one other way uh, that we're trying to go about and and, and getting uh, you know trying different things and uh, and that's really how how we think it's going to going to work is trying different technologies as they trickle down. Things like FLIR, for instance, is now starting to get a little more affordable than certainly it was ten fifteen years ago. Uh, I, th- I think you guys use flair, don't you? At the Cinemax thing. Um, well, and actually, Sheen just uh, invested in uh, a new flair. So, and we've been fortunate enough to uh, have other friends of ours that have l- loaned us uh, flares at different uh, different times. So, but uh, we now have one in the group. So we're excited Great. to to test that. So. Yeah. Um, the, I mean, the best that we can hope for with with uh, with that kind of evidence is it's going to come back as an unknown species because we correct. don't have a, a type specimen. So. Right. But it's so, data I mean, that can be entered you, into a da- database. At least right. we can get some comparable samples, and that's you know once we start building a database uh, of, for instance, different hair samples, which. Uh, uh, our mutual friends are doing, you know, and and finding some consistencies between these unknown uh, samples. Uh, that uh, I mean, you're right. That's that's the best we could hope for, and frankly, that's good uh, because otherwise, you're attaching it to something that's already known. So, but as long as it's distinct and and unclassified, then then we've got something to work with. Yeah, and Larry's reminding me. Yes, that yes, Larry, we did use your your FLIR from uh, your work <laughs> for a while until they sold it. So, and uh, that was cool because it actually recorded. But uh, so I'd like to talk about uh, your your new endeavor, the American Primate Conservancy. I mean, when you and Diane. Uh, Got married and got together. You combined. You each were doing separate, uh, had separate kind of agencies for for uh, for Bigfoot per se. And and now, uh, you know, the Bigfoot Power Couple, one of the Bigfoot Power Couples, <laughs> have combined and uh, you come up with a new uh, uh, agency, uh, the American Primate Conservancy. And Correct. what is the the purpose of of the American Primate Conservancy? Um, I I think it's what it it, it has been all along for us. Um, like you say, Diane, Diane and I had been researching. We figured now us collectively sixty three years, and uh, in between us, and and to her credit, she's done done this far longer than I have. <clears throat> she had uh, 
the stalking hominid uh, research uh, website and a nonprofit, and and I have the American Primate uh, Foundation as far back as 1998, and we decided once we got married, yeah, we're, let's let's consolidate our our knowledge and our research and and do this together. So. <coughs> Uh, so we just, just decided to that if we're going to do this, we, you know, we need to kind of rebrand it a little bit to show that that this is something new, and that uh, and that we're now working together. So the American Primate Conservancy is what was born of that. We we feel that you know, yeah, big, we went from foundation to conservancy, but for us, it was a really a, something. Uh, symbolic in that a foundation can is really pretty a basic bland you know entity whereas the conservancy really talked about where we're going with this and what we want to do and so the mission statement of the conservancy is basically the discovery research knowledge recognition and ultimate protection for these creatures and it really has to happen in that order and so, you know, we're we're kind of in the in between the discovery and research phase. I mean, these things have been discovered. There's no question. I've discovered them per se, but uh, they're being discovered all the time. So what we're doing now is we're in the research phase, and uh, and and then collecting that knowledge. And and you kind of alluded to the, a project that that we've kind of worked together on, uh, the the uh, project we've uh, dubbed Share. And this is really a, uh, a a consortium of different organizations that are on the same path, so to speak. And and uh, it only makes sense to us that you know, as long as our research is is kept close to the chest and 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 and, and isolated from one another. It, it's it's just going to set back, you know, getting to where we want to be. And so with SHARE, which stands for Sasquatch Hunters Academic Research Exchange, uh, we are setting uh, a standard in data sharing between groups, and uh, it's still in its in its design, you know, stage. It's being developed as we speak. But uh, we're really excited about it in working with you and, and the Olympic Project and some others in being able to kind of collaborate collaborate our, our data and being able to, to access each other's data and, and respectfully and giving credit where it's due. And so that's, the, that's where the knowledge piece comes in, the data collection point. And then from there, the, the recognition, and by that I mean the scientific taxonomic classification of these of these amazing creatures, whatever they are, whether they be hominid or or a great ape or, or something in between, we don't know. But but it's critical if we're ever going to get them protected that they're they're first and foremost recognized by the scientific community as a legitimate species in and of themselves. And that's the challenge and that's where we're at right now. And uh you know, a few things that we brought up at the Sasquatch Summit that is kind of exciting um, is that for the first time, uh, international agency that that that's in charge of uh, classifying new species has actually uh, done so uh, in one particular case uh, of an animal, or actually in this case an insect, but still was willing to go forward and accept it as a new species simply from photographic evidence. So that's that's kind of, uh, uh, I mean, they set a precedence. And so, you know, it's not the best uh, evidence, but it, but if that gets them to that stage, then we can we can kind of roll roll that forward into the protection. Uh, yeah, as, as encouraging really as that, that. Yeah, as encouraging as that is, don't you, I mean, we've had some, We've got the Patterson-Gimlin footage, but do you really think that any science, 
the scientific that that's going to work be sufficient for for to prove Bigfoot to the scientific community, if, even if we had a clear, uh, you know, a, a really clear, and it could be back. Well, I think the, the question is, is 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 photographic uh, imagery, whether it's photo, you know, still shots or video or film, going to be one hundred percent conclusive? Uh, no, I don't think it will. Only because of the magnitude of of what this type of a discovery uh, would amount to. You know, right. it's, it's easy to say uh, we can look under a microscope at a, you know, or, or extremely close range photography, crystal clear of an insect and say, nope, that's a new one. But it's just, I think the ramifications that 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 come along with an entirely species of a new species of a, a bipedal mammal of this proportion, it, it's going to require more than that. And, and what that'll be, I'm, uh, who knows, you know, yeah, ideally a type specimen needs to be collected and how that comes about can happen in a number of different ways. Whether one is found as a fossilized, or has died of natural causes, illness, old age, or injury, perhaps, or even an accidental um, uh, death. Uh, you know, things happen. Um, hopefully, it's not going to be intentionally at, at the point of a gun, but you know, it's inevitable that these things are going to be found, and it's it's just fascinating that people like you and I, uh, for all intents and purposes, are in the forefront of of, of of doing that research and and trying to bring the evidence that we need to. And uh, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get these things protected. I want to know that my my grandkids and great-grandkids someday may have the same opportunity that I have, you know. And, and we really don't know enough about these creatures to say that they're, the health of their species is good. And that's a big concern for me. Uh, we've literally watched dozens of scores of, of animals that have been classified and recognized go into absolute extinction right before our eyes just in, over the last hundred years. And it's well chronicled, and it's and it's sad. And, but it's based, you know, the truth of the matter is based out of ignorance. Is it either ignorance to the health or, or the plight of these animals or just pure ignorance in believing they exist in the first place. Uh, I can't help but think right. back to. I can't help to think back to uh, to the uh, the carrier pigeon. Uh, they it was supposed to be, you know, they, they were known to have existed by the by the billion in amazing swarms, and yet they watched the last one die right in front of them. They know the date. They know the time. They even had it named. This poor pigeon was named Martha, and they knew they had in their in their hands the last of a, of a species. And it's really one of the first times in history that that the exact time and date of a of a species being snuffed out happened right in front of us. I don't want that to happen. I'm not saying that's where they're at. I'm not saying. Wait, well, yeah, like you said we don't we don't know what their population is. I mean, I'm, I'm again, of the opinion that not that knowing we should, is ignorance. Sorry. Yeah, well, and that's um, the Bigfoot community has not been able to bring conclusive proof to, and, and this is being totally, like you said, it's being driven by citizen scientists. This is not something that you know we ha we're fortunate to have some um, actual people that are in the field that are science uh, scientists that are paying attention to it. Uh, to some to their own detriment in you know in their occupation, uh, I remember having a conversation with with Dr. Meldrum at the Olympic project about you know he's it it's a challenge for someone who is a is a professional scientist to say i'm I believe that I'm interested in the topic of Bigfoot and I believe they exist and because uh, it there's a real cost to to them um Rep, with their reputation and with with their their and sure. financially to to uh, take that so 
you know, Dr. Meldrum, Dr. Bendernagel, and you can see it, the frustration with Dr. Bendernagel of, uh, you know, that that his his colleagues don't recognize or refuse to recognize or even consider the possibility to a large degree. Well, and what? hats off to them and people like not only him, but I remember all of the the uh, the uh, angst that uh, Professor Grover Krantz had to put up with back in his day at uh, Washington State University. And, and but you know, the hats off to them that they're willing to step outside the box. I mean, was, I always thought that science was really the art of discovery. And and it seems like in this day and age that we've just gotten complacent in that regard and just decided that everything that is out there uh, certainly we must know about. And and we could it couldn't be any further from the truth. Scientists will tell you today that that we really have only cataloged roughly twenty percent of all the creatures on this planet. And that's that's uh Kind of uh, you know, obviously a lot of them in, in the in the oceans, but still, um, they're finding new species every year. In fact, last year over eighteen thousand new species of flora and fauna were cataloged for the first time. You know, but when I talk about the possibility of these things being threatened, um, you know, a lot of people look at the classification of of uh, endangered species as uh, well, they're either endangered or they're, they're threatened. Well, there's like nine different classifications that are recognized uh, by the uh, International Union for Conservation of Nature. That's the, the body of science that that I had spoke about as uh, uh, being willing to accept this, this last specimen on a photograph alone. There's actually nine different levels, uh, nine different groups, if you will, that all animals fall into. Uh, that if, in their in what they call their red list, and extinct is obviously the worst possible uh, category. But there's extinct in the wild, and that means that the only only those that that are exist are, are are in captivity. There's critically endangered which is even a higher level than endangered. Uh, threatened or vulnerable is another one. And then there's near threatened. So they, they list these things. And then there's, of course, least concerned. But there's another category that I find really interesting, and that's the category of data deficient, which means that they recognize there's something out there, but they don't have enough data to make an assessment of, it, uh, of its risk of extinction. And... Even in their own words, they're saying that that data deficient, the absence of records that indicate they're dangerously low in abundance, that a threatened status may well be justified, even though that, that they have not been uh, officially recognized. So, you know, I wish the mainstream science would get, get on board on this stuff, and uh, I think we have our answers to it than, than, we, than what we're, where we're at now. But uh, in the meantime, I think some, all we can do is roll up our sleeves and do what needs to be done. And I think sometimes that, uh, as a community, the, the Bigfoot community, the science, citizen science, and some of the clowns that, that have participated in the Bigfoot community have have shot ourselves in the foot because the and and there seems to be you know the media focuses on the humorous aspect of of the possibility of Bigfoot and they take any story ninety nine point nine percent of the time when when the there's a, a story in the media it there's they play it up with, with a humorous uh, slant to it which is of course frustrating and then we have you know people that. Um, that commit hoaxes that get a lot of of uh, media attention, and that I don't think that that's to me why that is so detrimental to that kind of activity is detrimental to to uh, proving the existence and getting scientists 
to take it seriously because they don't want to touch that, you know, with a 10-foot pole. Well, I think there's a lot of... Well, too, that, you know, Bigfoot is a pop icon. It's got a lot of interest uh, just in social media. Um, as you see all these, uh, these uh, quote-unquote... Uh, um, reality shows that are out there, and, and they're commercially exploited quite often as well. I mean, it's what pays, right? I mean, I, it, it even sells coffee. So there's just, uh, you know, a lot of the, a lot of ways these uh, these creatures are, are just, you know, become a brand name or a, or a pop icon. That, uh, hey, now watch that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, no, it's... It, which is fine, but uh, you see everything from Bigfoot trailers to Bigfoot tires to you name it. Um, in fact, I even was behind a truck today or a bus today, and, and the Oregon Department of Transportation was had started advertising about you know watching out for pedestrians, and, and you got a man and a wife pushing a carriage, and there's a Bigfoot walking a dog. So that's that's the that's ODOT. So even the government's getting in on the on the act so but anyway i i know we're probably pressed for time i got a minute to kind of catch us catch up oh, no, on we, what the con- conservancy is yeah yeah we to? have plenty of time okay you have plenty of time all right <laughs> so that's it yeah, i'm really I just want to make what... sure that, that i want to make sure we, that, that we discuss a little bit about what the, the conservancy's uh plans are um with regards to where we are today and where we expect to be in the next 10 years. Because we got some very, very ambitious plans. So, Yes, and you, we've talked about those, and, and it's pretty exciting stuff. Um, obviously, with the name of, of the conservancy being primate, is that, I mean, is that your feeling of what, what we're dealing with or what we're looking for? Is a primate, or is do you think this is something that's more... Uh, animal than human than well. What do you think? When you look at when you look at tax, a lot of people tend to associate the word primate with with uh, with monkeys and apes, and, and uh, that's not entirely true. If you look at the the taxonomic classification of uh, primates, it's a pretty broad uh, spectrum, which which includes old world monkeys, lesser apes, great apes, and humans. So it doesn't, using the word primate, it doesn't doesn't uh, uh, take human out of the picture as well. Humans are in that same classification. So, But I do think it's fair to say, as, as you kind of work through the animal kingdom and, and work your way up to species and then subspecies, we get stuck at that one point. There, there, to me, there's no question that they fall into primate. It's from there where we go. Are they simian? Are they hominid? That's that's the distinction. But primate is 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 a little more general than that, I and mean, it, it it covers a wider range of of creatures. So it does not exclude humans. That's for sure. Uh, what they are, I don't know. I you know I used to totally exclude that. I thought this has got to be a a, an evolved great ape, a greater ape, if you will. But over time, I've kind of shifted my thinking, and, I, and I, I'm more open-minded to believe that they may be, in fact, a um, a, a relic humanoid, a, a hominid of some sort. I don't know. Um, you know, I, part of my studies has gone back to uh, not just finding the newest, latest, greatest things that are out there in terms of, of research, but I've gone and did a 180 at one point, and I decided to look for the absolute oldest information I can find, because it kind of slapped me upside the head one day that, hey, these things didn't just come on the radar when Europeans showed up. You know, obviously, there's going to be a, a much longer history, and so I, I did. I went back and I studied as much as I could on Native American lore. Uh, most of which was never written down until really the, the 18th century because most Native Americans did not have a written language. But as some of these uh, these uh, 
uh, tribal lore was being recorded and they started bringing these pieces together and getting them into some textbooks, there are some very good resource materials out there that actually have nothing to do specifically with, with these creatures, but are certainly peppered with with accounts of them. Um, and it's interesting to note that the more modern uh, uh, Native American tribes um, referred to them as another tribe themselves. They called them the first one, or they called them the old one. In essence, indicating that they were already here when we got here. So, who knows? I mean, they didn't. Again, they didn't look at them like a deer or an elk. They looked at them as another tribe, just an ancient tribe, an older tribe. So, you know, who's to say? I mean, certainly these things are very intelligent, and and, and certainly more so than than a common, you know, gri- uh, ape or gorilla. So, you know, otherwise we would have. We would have, uh, we wouldn't be having this discussion. So maybe they know us more than we know them, and maybe that's why they stay away from us. So a couple questions from the chat room. One is: Have you found any? Um, we had Derek Randall's on a couple of weeks ago, and he was talking about the bedding area that the Olympic Project was made aware of up in Washington that they're the ongoing investigation or have you found anything similar uh, in your investigations, bedding areas or bedding sites? Well, uh, yes and no. Not not of the type that uh, Derek and the project up there have, have located. And that's some really amazing, uh, fascinating discoveries that they're coming across. However, when it comes to uh, shelters, if you will, um, structures that I believe these creatures are responsible for, um, yes, I have found a total of four over the course of the years that, you know, I'm one of the, I'm, I'm one of these researchers that literally I eliminate every single possibility uh, before, I, with I don't jump to conclusions. Um, I I want to eliminate, you know, if can something could there be another explanation, for, you know, and uh, on four occasions, um, the first being up on the clock, well, a tributary of the clock in this uh, Fish Creek, uh, I was actually with Joe Bielart. This goes back a ways. Um, he was setting up some bait. Uh, station and, and, and um, trying to collect some evidence and I kind of wandered off a little bit in this area and came across a structure that really defied any sort of natural cause and it, this was um, an assembly of trees that literally came in from every every point of the compass converging their crowns in one specific location this is not on the edge of a of a forest, but deep in the forest, where no other trees around this structure were uh, looked anything like it. You know, so, and then as you as you get in, literally underneath the branches, you realize that that I mean, not only were the you look at the stacking structure, for instance. You kind of reverse engineer it, and you know it's obvious. You look at at the lowest branch and say, "Okay, that's the first one that came down," and it may have come down from the east, falling to the west. Then you look for the second one, and it's pretty easy to pick it apart, the stacking order. And when you do, and you realize these trees are being felled if in in a very purposeful manner in coming from every different direction and not in any specific order, but it's just, it was amazing. Even the the ground beneath this uh, um, convergence of treetops was worn pretty bare. So it's uh, worn pretty bare. So it, something had certainly 
spent a lot of time in there. Um, the second one I found was up on the Wishkaw River with when I was uh, researching with the late Fred Bradshaw. Um, we'd been called up there to investigate some vocalizations that were coming out of the Aberdeen watershed, and we spent several days up there. And again, I came across a similar structure. This one seemed to have been considerably older because all the foliage had had died. And frankly, the way these things are constructed, the trees are either broken off just above the ground or they're you know, uprooted halfway. And it's only a matter of time before these trees die. But in this case, because all the foliage, the needles and the leaves have fallen off, it, it, it stood out like a sore thumb. It really looked like if you had a teepee and you just took the skin off of it. Uh, very purposeful. Uh, again, re by reverse engineering the stacking order, it was absolutely engineered. It wasn't snow or wind or ice damage. It was, it, and again, nothing, nothing else within sight of this structure uh, seemed to have been impacted like that. My third one I found was up in a, uh, investigating in Ape Canyon on the east slope of Mount St. Helens, and the fourth one I found up the Clackamas River. Uh, not far from the Little Brook Ranger Station. And again, and I have pictures of these as well, but it's just, you know, again, eliminating all other possibilities of how this could have happened, but seeing a very distinct pattern in in how these things are built. And frankly, I think these are just field expedient shelters um, that they can probably throw together in a matter of 15 to 20 minutes. But still, it takes time for them to, to find the right spot and to look at these trees and go, okay, this one, that one, that, yeah, this will work, and, and then go about making it. But uh, I haven't seen any of this, the ground nest per se, um, but uh, I have seen some, some, some trees that have obviously been used to me, at least obvious to me, that have been used as, as some form of shelter. Well, that, and I think uh, the first incident that you were talking about of uh, the Clackamas with Joe is again in his book. So, if uh, I can't, uh, I'm, I'm actually have not finished it. I'm in the middle of reading Joe's uh, Bigfoot Highway book, and it's Joe Bielart and Cliff Olson wrote that, and and you can find it. Uh, just search, you know, Bigfoot Highway or Joe Bielart's book online, and I'm sure you can find it. I believe it. it's so, um, Oregon, Oregon Bigfoot Highway, I think. Is Oregon name. Bigfoot Highway, thank you. But, yeah, very good book, well put together, and uh, uh, a lot of activity. I just saw Joe at, at uh, Hop Squatch the other night and was telling him how I appreciated the book that that uh, and how much, over such a long period of time, that somebody... Uh, Collected all that information and shared it. So, and I know that you're someone who has been been active in in that area as well. So, um, let's let's talk about the plans for for the uh, American Ape Conservancy. Uh, what you know, you're where are you now, um, and where what are your your future plans for for this? I know that part of it is you know collaboration, but but you have some pretty ambitious goals for the conservancy. Yeah, indeed we do, and and we're really excited about it. Um, we're we're really planning to throw ourselves into this in in a, in, uh, in ways we've we've never uh, before, and, and in ways I don't think anybody has uh, in the past. And, and uh, part of it has to do with the fact that uh, currently I am an active uh, soldier, and it has taken uh, a lot of my time to to do the training that I do and and uh I only get three weekends off uh, uh every month uh due to uh, weekend training that I also have to be involved in on top of Monday through Friday. And so it it's you know, to find time to do the research and and, and uh, I wanna I'd love to author some books and discuss my background but I think key to this really going the direction we want to is when I retire, and, and I'm looking uh, currently at just about three years away from that mark. So the Conservancy, really right now, we've got a four-phase four plan. 
and that we're currently in the first phase, and that is continued uh, field research in this undisclosed uh, area uh, for the next three years or so, uh, again, using trail cameras and seismogram sensors, setting up base camps uh, for, you know, uh, at least week-long uh, expeditions, parabolic microphones, digital recorders, clear, that kind of stuff. Uh, we plan to try to bring as much of what we can afford to to bear and continue on that mode. The second phase, uh, actually, we're pretty excited about this. It's, a, it's the, um, as you know, we, we, the wife and I live aboard a, uh, a 42-foot boat in the Portland area. It is, it's rated as a coastal uh, cruising, uh, cruising yacht, and, and so it can easily go from Mexico to Alaska. It's very seaworthy in that sense. And and so when we do retire, we plan to spend uh, certainly one season, uh, probably the summer of 2019, uh, and possibly another season uh, in 2020 using the boat as a research vessel. And by that, I mean we plan to do some very uh, uh, in-depth uh, marine expeditions, if you will, Going into the numerous uh, fjords and, and sounds and rivers that that punctuate the west coast of British Columbia that go deep into nothing but, but wilderness uh, where there are no uh, humans at all. And uh, to, to do that, we plan to certainly use the, the, the boat as a launching pad for a drone, sending that ahead of us. Uh, as much as uh, a mile or so ahead of us to do some initial scouting. We also uh, hope to have a flare-mounted, uh, uh, excuse me, a mass-mounted flare system, which they do make uh, for the maritime industry, and uh, and scour the shorelines looking for any sort of heat signatures. And uh, to our knowledge, nobody's done that. Um, ultimately, our uh, after say uh, uh, 2020, uh, our plan is to try to establish some long-term, and by long-term I'm talking six months to a year duration uh, expeditions in the areas that have had recent activity. Uh, we believe that much along the, the lines of uh, Diane Fossey and Jane Goodall and Brute uh, that uh, these individuals were able to be so successful in getting data uh, on gorillas and chimpanzees and, and, and orangutans uh, because they went into an area that they knew they existed and they refused to leave. They set up long-term field uh, habituation, if you will. They made it very clear uh, that to these animals that they were not passing through, that they were now part of the neighborhood. And in time, we're able to get these creatures to come in and, and investigate them and to, to let down their their uh, their fear of them. And uh, their research is by far uh, some of the most amazing research on primates. And I think that might work with these creatures as well. I think they're very intelligent, and I think, I think that intelligence... Um, begets curiosity, and we hope to get out there, stay out there, long term, and hope to pique that curiosity and and break down this barrier of of uh, evasiveness, and and hopefully get the type of evidence conclusively uh, in order to get them recognized and again protected as need be. And finally. Um, and, and keep in mind, too, that when we talk about these phases, they are all, to a degree, running concurrently. So it's not like in three years we're going to start doing the, you know, we're just going to flip a switch and, and take the boat up the, up into Canada, and then we're going to, you know, all of these phases uh, are, are, are being developed concurrently as we go along. 
uh, our final phase uh, is that we would uh, we intend to uh, establish a first of its kind world class uh, Bigfoot interpretation center and research center that uh, somewhere in the Pacific Northwest that will not only be a you know um, a tourist attraction per se, but will be a magnet for uh, eyewitnesses, for instance, to come in and bring in counts, uh, uh, a magnet for researchers to come to and to study and, 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 and interested parties to come and learn. We, we intend to have a, a uh, four to 500 seat auditorium uh, where conferences can be held uh, and uh, classrooms where classes can be put on on how to, you know, do casting, how to analyze hair, a full-scale laboratory to include uh, DNA sequencers and SPME, so the, again, solid phase micro extraction analysis, uh, hair analysis, and uh, and uh, a library of, of a multimedia studio. And yeah, there will be a component to it that that will be somewhat touristy. Uh, uh, there will be exhibit halls, of course, and uh, and some other uh, items that be themed along the, those terms. Um, we plan to have it put on some fairly substantial uh, grounds to, that will include uh, a nature uh, uh, walk uh, through uh, similar. Bigfoot habitat, and uh, and uh, the more we we discuss it, the more uh, ideas we get about it. But uh, something of that nature, we're going to be looking at about somewhere between thirty and forty million dollars. And so, you know, it's for that reason that the, the, the bigger plans, the longer term duration expeditions, and and, and really the uh, we're going to need funding. Uh, there's no question about it. Just just the uh, the uh, the research vessel piece uh, it's going to cost us anywhere from fifty to seventy thousand dollars between food and and uh, fuel and and whatnot. Uh, and it just gets more expensive as we go. But we hope that in the process that we yield some some uh, some good information and and uh, and that will encourage people to. Uh, to donate to us. Like I said, we are uh, established as a nonprofit organization here in Oregon, and uh, we look forward to anybody who sponsor us, uh, such as as uh, uh, Sasquatch Coffee has, and a few of our friends, uh, and uh, any sort of you know sponsorships, grants, contributions uh, of any sort. We're more than open to uh, accepting, and people have been coming forward really out of out of the blue and just saying, "Hey, we like what you're doing. We like the sound of what you're doing. That's that's the direction we think things should go." And you know, who do I write the check to? So uh, it's it's starting to pick up. And uh, like I say, once we get a little more established here in the next few months, uh, we plan to have our 501c3 uh, status and and as uh, you, might have, you mentioned earlier, we just purchased a a, uh, a mountain uh, a home up in uh, the Mount Hood area that uh, we plan to headquarter our work. And you know, we're still in the process of unpacking boxes and stuff. But you know, once Diane and I consolidate all of our uh, files and our and our paperwork and our library. Uh, uh, it's it's going to be pretty substantial. So, anyway, that's what we've got planned in the short, mid, and long term, and uh, we're just really excited about uh, you know pouring ourselves into it. And uh, if somebody wants to make a contribution or support the, your efforts with the uh, American Primate Conservancy, how can they go about doing that? Um, we have a website, uh, American Primate uh, Conservancy. It's actually at AmericanPrimate.com, www. Um, 
um, not to confuse anybody, but that is going to ultimately evolve into uh, .org, but currently it's at .com. Um, and there we have information, contact information, how you can get a hold of us uh, and uh, what we're doing, and and, uh, and we're more than happy to uh, uh, accept any sort of help, whether it's uh, in person or, or uh, just monetarily. Um, we can use all the help we can get. Very cool. So that's www.americanprimate.com if if uh, someone wants to go check out the the American Primate Conservancy and what Todd and Diane are are doing. And uh, so you're, um, I've got a call from uh, uh, Henry May has a question for you. Henry, I'm going to go ahead and bring him on. Henry, welcome to Monster X, buddy. Hello, Henry, are you? <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> Were you having yeah. a nap? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I forgot I had myself muted. <laughs> uh, yeah, ahead, Henry, uh, Todd, I wanted to ask you about your new house. Uh, how close is it to civilization, <laughs> or is it? Well, it's it's extremely rural. Um, it is it's on a on a private road. There are a couple other houses on it, but we're actually backed up to the uh, Wildwood Recreation Area, uh, which is just a really a continuation of our natural woods uh, that goes on into a, a, a very large park. Um, so, um, again, we're just we have just a little over an acre and a half here, but we are. Uh, uniquely positioned from this point uh, to be in deep woods within a matter of minutes. It's really not uh, not hard to get there. Okay. Oh, well, by the way, tonight the truth is out there. Oh yes, the X Files has returned <laughs> for a yeah. brief visit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah. there. So yeah, X Files tonight, and and a new finding Bigfoot. So. You gotta record one and uh watch the other, so or have two TVs. Yeah, or have have a TV with screen within screen. There you go. I don't know go. if they still make those. I don't know if they still make those. <laughs> um picture in a picture. But uh so how's Diane doing? Diane's doing great. She's uh she's downstairs uh filling backing things and changing doorknobs and we just literally moved into it officially this weekend. So, uh, oh, that's great! That's great. So I'm making her do all the work while I'm up here, Gavin. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations! I mean, it, it, I saw the picture. It's a beautiful house. Oh, thanks, Henry. Yeah, well, you're welcome to come out anytime. We hope you'll uh, make it out to beach for one of these years. Oh, I, 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 I sure will give it a try, Todd. All right. Well, just wanted to briefly call in. Thanks for taking my call, Gunner. You bet. Thanks, Henry. Yep. All right. Bye. So, you are the host of of one of the the premier Bigfoot events, which it isn't really a conference. It is a conference, but it's it's a researchers conference, basically, uh, Beachfoot. And are, first of all, are you you are planning on having a Beachfoot 2016, correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, we've already scheduled a date, and we've reserved the campground, and uh, we've already started lining up uh, speakers. And uh, yeah, like you say, it's, it's it's unique. It's not really a conference. I tend to refer to it more as a as a researcher's retreat because it's very, as you know, uh, it's very casual and and, and laid back, and uh, we uh, don't necessarily keep a real tight schedule and we keep it loose enough that if other people want to uh join in they can but uh now this is uh beachfoot is a, co- a concept that just came to me back in 2008 um when i i just kind of thought about all the amazing people that i have i've met over the years and and the and and some like i mentioned before that have that have passed on and, and all the information they all have or, or or took with them and 
and what it would be like to have all these people in one room at the same time. I mean, just the brain trust of information would be amazing, you know. And so, I, one day I I I just came across this location, and I thought, you know what, I, this would be a great place to hold this. And you know, there is something that would be better than getting everybody in the same room at the same time, and that's getting them all around a big bonfire with a cold beer in their hands and just letting them, you know, get to know one another. And and so in 2008, we had our first speech, but and, and it's obviously the name is kind of corny, but it's it's just a play on words uh, of Beachwood and the fact, or Bigfoot and the fact that we try to hold it near the coast or in the Oregon coast range at least. And we've moved it around over the years, and uh, most recently we've, we've found a pretty nice spot that, that seems everybody likes. So this year it's going to be from the 21st of July until the 24th, so four days. Um, I should point out it is invitation only. Um, there's still a little bit of room out there yet. Uh, we like to mix it up. We, of course, have our regular <laughs> We like to, you know, we've got our regulars that come every year, and and I won't bother name dropping, but to say that uh, we like to get some new fresh faces in there too. So, so if you're interested, I do have a a Facebook page just simply called Beachfoot. You might want to take a look at it. Um, it's really nine years of a lot of a lot of good fellowship and fun and networking and just um, well. Uh, Gunner, I know you, you could probably say it even better. You've been there, you've seen it. It's it's, it's just a great location. Uh, it's yeah. research. It's it's researchers just getting together and 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 getting to know each other on a personal level and 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 having a good time, and and again sharing their research. Uh, this year, uh, Dr. John Bindernog was already agreed to speak. He's been doing some amazing work uh, up in British Columbia on Comrade Island. Um, uh, so he's going to talk with us about what's been going on up there. Uh, I've got three other speakers lined up. Uh, I've already got three different music groups lined up that they just offered to come. And everybody does this voluntarily. That's the other thing that makes this unique. We don't pay our speakers. We don't pay the bands that come. We don't comp anybody. It's just you know, people just say, "Yeah, I want to be there, and I want to, I want to contribute," and they do, and it's just, it's just a lot of fun. It's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. Yeah, but uh, and I will uh, list off some of the people that you know you've had uh, last year. Uh, you know, of course, Dr. Ben Nagel was there. Um, Derek Randall's, of course, from, of the Olympic Project was there. Uh, uh, Cliff and Bobo from Finding Bigfoot and actual Bigfoot researchers were there. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on. Uh, Lee, uh, Lauren Coleman was there. I mean, if, everywhere, you, you know, you can't, uh, it, it's just Peter amazing. Byrne, it's a lot of fun. Peter Byrne, of course. Regular. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and you have a very close relationship with Peter. Um, how did that come to be? You know, what you, you guys, he's one of the first people that, you, you said when you first had your encounter and you ran across the phone number for uh, his project out out uh, was he in the yeah. Thousand or Hood River? Yeah. So um, how that he was actually that, up uh, in an area of Parkdale, which is uh, uh, just uh, south of of Hood River. Um, he was working initially with the Bigfoot Research Project, and uh, and that kind of ran its course, and then. Uh, um, you know, he introduced me to Ray Crow and Larry Lund and uh, some of the meetings that Ray used to put on in uh, in uh, North Portland. And so I started going to those and getting to know people. And, and Peter would show up on occasion. And we just got to become good friends. And and uh, I feel very blessed to have him as uh, as such. And uh, we've done a number of expeditions together um, up in the Blue Mountains, uh, for instance, down at Bluff Creek uh, on one occasion. Uh, we've done investigations together as well, where somebody just spontaneously says, "Hey, something's going on," and, and we we work together in Chitwood, Oregon, on one and. Uh, 
oh, one off at the Sandy River um, escapes me at the moment. But, um, yeah, you know, he's just, uh, you know, he's, he's he's an amazing man with an amazing story, uh, even outside of big fighting. And, uh, you know, I'm, we just, you know, we, we we just have a great time when we're together, and, and, and he's always a, always a joy to be around. And, and for whatever reason, he seems like me. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> but uh, we uh, we we just get along good, and we we um, enjoy each other's you know, each other's company. Uh, I visit our home down in California, and I you know I'm I'm pleased to say that I not only have I don't know how many people can say this, but uh, I have probably the only wedding license that is witnessed by Bob Gimlin and Peter Byrne. That's pretty cool. And, that meant a lot. And conducted us, by uh, Retman Mullis. That's right. <laughs> yeah. No, that was so, that was a kick. But no, I just uh, you know I just seem to run the same circles, and he's introduced me to a lot of people, and, and uh, loves to Did I lose you? No, I'm here. Oh, okay, there you go. Thought maybe you dozed off. But, <laughs> but uh, so I get that a lot. Go. I mean, what what uh, what do we got going with uh, what? What's your current research? You're you've got an area, and right now it's kind of under snow. Is that correct? Um. You know, I know the snow level went up to 5,000 feet. In order to get to our site, you actually have to uh, reach 5,000 feet and then work your way back down. Um, but I'm sure there's enough residual snow there that it's we're probably in a couple months from being able to actually get all the way into where those cameras are. So right now you're kind of just letting your cameras soak in there, and, and then you'll go in when you can get in and... and uh, I mean, you. I'm assuming that. What's the process? You go in, you change out batteries, pull, you know, pull cards, and and. Uh, yeah, we actually you, you we actually, actually go do through the. Stuff. Well, we right. we have a, 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 a computer tablet we take with us. We actually download the the files and view them right there in the field. And like you say, maintenance the cameras, change out the the batteries, and. Uh, and sometimes relocate them, depending on how much or how little activity we've been getting. Um, we're trying a few different things. Uh, for instance, um, uh, aiming cameras at each other. Um, uh, this kind of, you know, you, you've heard people say, well, they know the camera's there, but they're, they'll mess with the camera, but they won't step in front of it. Well, if they're anywhere near our cameras, there's generally another camera trained on it. At least in a couple, three sites I'm thinking of. So, um, but yeah, we'll we'll uh, we'll get up there and, and relocate them and just and, uh, download what we have. And I'm I'm anxious to get in there because you know they've been in there now for a good four months or more. But yeah, it's always there's always something on there. Even if some uh, you know people, uh, it's amazing they walk by and not even know they're there. Or in some cases they do and give you a wave and a, or or the finger or whatever and. Um, but thankfully, we haven't lost any cameras so far. I, I have in the past, but uh, and so far we've gotten pretty good at hiding them. But uh, yeah, and then there, of course, we do our own research uh, with the, the armchair stuff as well. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff that, that's coming out, and a lot of good ideas. And, um, do you? But do you have? Are you are you uh, planning any speaking engagements this year? Somebody wants to come in and hear you speak live, which is always interesting yeah, for me. Um, well, we've uh, we have uh, been scheduled to speak at the International Bigfoot Conference uh, coming up in, in September, which is going to be held in Kennewick, Washington. I want to say it's third through the sixth, but I could be wrong on that. But but uh, that information's out there. It's the first first annual. Uh, uh, International Bigfoot uh, Conference, um, 
and that's being put on. I think Ed Brown has a big part in that, and there's there's a number of people involved, and so a lot of big names showing up. So, um, but Diane and I have both been asked to speak there. Um, Shane and, and I are uh, also presenting there. So, well, I said big names. <laughs> <laughs> we're li- we're we're little names, but no, it's it's yeah. exciting. That one's that one's it should be a good time, so Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Um but other than the you know, the occasional spontaneous uh, interview, uh, nothing else on the books really, apparently. So but you've got I know you always have your hands full putting a beach foot together. So say somebody wanted to attend Beachfoot, you said there were a few spaces left. How would they go about, what's that process look like? Is there a lottery being held? Well, I mean, how do they, <laughs> is it a bidding uh, process? It, well, in, in a sense, you know, Diane and I both uh, look at the, the uh, applicants and, and, and sometimes, well, you know, well, where did you hear about this, and, and what's your um, what's your involvement in big footing? And can you just kind of let us know? And and it's unfortunate every year there we do have to turn certain you know, people away because uh, we are limited as to how many people we can have there. I mean, technically we're only supposed to have a hundred people there, and, and we blew way past that last year. And thank God the camp hosts were. We're accommodating and, and uh, forgiving on that, but uh, we we are limited, uh, mostly just logistically due to you know sanitary services and you know um, bathrooms and garbage capacities and things like that. But um, yeah, we we're open to new new people joining. And again, if you go to the, my Facebook page, uh, simply called Beachfoot. Um, Take a look what's there. See if it's something that you might be interested in. If you are, uh, we're always open to looking over applicants, and, and if uh, if we feel that uh, we can be mutually beneficial to each other, that you've got something to add to the conversation, and, and that that, uh, uh, that it's something that you'd be a good fit for, then then we're open to that. So. Uh, don't I, I don't discourage anybody from at least applying for that, uh, and they can just send me an email uh, to my personal email address, which has been out there for a long time, but it's just simply American Primate at AOL dot com. Well, that'll tell you how long it's been out there it's at AOL dot com. But uh, anyway, um, shoot me an email and let's let's talk. Um, like I said, it's. It's uh it's the only venue of its kind, and uh, I'm I'm sure uh, whoever shows up, I haven't gotten too many complaints. We're getting close to to running out of time here, Todd. I I want to thank you for taking time out. I know this is a crazy time for you with getting moved and and everything. So I well, I was able to time out of your day. I was. I was able to talk you home to let me drop it off late tonight, so no worries. <laughs> Besides the football yeah, I know. Song, so. And uh, I did want to thank you. I, did did uh, you get Thomas Steenberg to, to commit to coming to Beachfoot this year? Uh, yeah, yeah. In fact, he, he has uh, agreed to come, and, and hopefully we'll get him to talk. Yeah, and he's you were gracious enough to speak to him for for us here at Monster X, and he has agreed to uh, come on Monster X, which he doesn't oh, do a lot of podcasts. So he is scheduled for February 7th, I believe it is. And uh, right. so we're excited about that. I know that Julie is mega a mega Thomas fan, so um, be sure and put that on your calendar. And uh, next week we've got... Uh, the folks from Crypto Crew are are going to be here on Monster X, and uh, we're excited about that too. So, uh, a lot of great shows coming up. And again, Todd, I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, chat with us today. And um, it's it's always great to talk with uh, our friends about Bigfoot, and uh, you are definitely one of those people. So, thanks again, friend. Uh, and, uh, 
Go ahead. Good, and thanks for having me. You betcha. And again, folks, if you uh, are interested in finding out more about uh, Todd and Diane's American Primate Conservancy, you can go to www.americanprimate.com and check it out. Um, some very ambitious plans, and I look forward to to uh, working with Todd and Diane um, on seeing those to fruition. And uh, please uh, jump in there and support if you can. So uh, for Shane Corson, who uh, is on his way to San Diego, and we lost him somewhere during the middle of the show, and uh, myself uh, and Julie and Loriana and Mr. Mike, who has joined us on Monster X, uh, have a good evening, and we will see you back here at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern for Monster X Radio. Good night, everybody. <laughs>